kids. But listen, it's a lot being a teenager these days. Like the pressure that you have to battle with your own mental health and your own walk with God on top of the stuff that you're dealing with in the house that you don't have no control over. You know, I'm grown. I can have some kind of say-so in my house, but y'all stuck in the house. You don't make decisions. And you try to make decisions, but every time you try to make a decision, it ends up worse. So you got to go home and wrestle with certain things that are out of your control that sometimes leads to anxiety. And then you got to wake up at, what, 5 o'clock in the morning to go to school? And I mean, like, some of the stuff y'all dealing with in school these days is crazy. I was on Instagram, and I heard about, like, this very violent situation that went on at Brookwood High School a couple months ago. And I'm like, yo, for real, y'all dealing with this? In the suburbs? Like, y'all ain't even hood. Like, y'all got it made in certain ways, but, like, y'all really going through some stuff out here. Not only at Brookwood, but I've talked to people at Norcross. i talked to people at Paul Duke, and it doesn't even matter what zip code you're in. There are so many things that you're battling at school that can often lead to anxiety. And tonight, I just want to take a few minutes to give you some keys on what to do when anxiety attacks. Because if you haven't faced anxiety before, I don't want to speak any word curses over you, but I will let you know that moments will come up in your life that will trigger at times anxiety. And I just want to give you three keys, three things that you need to know, not from an Instagram influencer, not from something that you saw or an article on the internet, but three things you need to know from the word of God on what to do when anxiety attacks. So I want to look at this scripture in 2 Kings chapter 4. We see this story about this woman, and the Bible doesn't give her name, but the Bible describes her as the widow with olive oil. And in verse 1 of chapter 4, the scripture says, The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha. Elisha was the prophet during that time, the man who heard from God. Another scripture says the man of God. And prophets were people who were able to hear from God and share a word of knowledge with people regarding what God had to say to a group of people. And this woman had access to the man of God. And the scripture says that the woman said, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elijah replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except this small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't just ask a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour the what? Oil into all of the jars. And as each is what? Filled. Put, it, put one to the side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her sons, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God and he said, go and sell the what? Oil and pay off your debts. And you and your sons can live on what is left? I got three things you need to know when anxiety attacks. And the first thing that I need to let you know is that you need to know who you have access to. The woman who was a widow, a.k.a. her husband had just died, had access to the prophet. Why? Not because she was just walking down the street and she saw the man of God. Not because she was in the temple or the church. Why? It was because of the relationships that she had. Everyone didn't have access to the man of God or the prophet, but she had access to the prophet because of who her husband was. And the scripture says that she went to the prophet and she went to get advice on how to deal with this situation that I can only imagine had to be very terrifying. She said her husband had just died. Has anybody in here ever dealt with grief? Like you ever lost a loved one? 
And it might have not been by death, but someone in your family may have not been present in your family anymore. And you have to process and deal with the fact that that person is no longer there. Have you ever even had to grieve a relationship, someone that you was connected to, but then something happened and things didn't go with the way you expected and that relationship tore apart and now you're dealing with emotions and the fact that that person isn't coming back? Has anyone in this place ever dealt with grief before? And if you dealt with grief, you would know that grief will have you all over the place. Like you don't know what to think. One moment you mad, next moment you sad. One moment you want to fight and you know you can't even fight. But grief will have you all over the place. So imagine what's going on in the head of this woman who just lost her companion, the man that she loved. And not only the fact is she dealing with grief, but on one side where there's sadness, on the other side there's fear. Fear because they said that her sons were going to be sold into slavery. See, I'm not talking about the slavery that happened in this country 400 years ago. I'm talking about slavery in the context of Israel thousands of years ago to where if you owe somebody money, you know, like them student loans that some of y'all about to take out next week. <laughs> and if you didn't pay that back, you feel me? They're not only going to charge you and you're not going to be able to get a good credit score. But what they would do is say, oh, bet we're not going to wait you to get your bread right. We're going to take your kids. We're going to take everything you have, and they're going to work for us until what is owed is paid for. It was gutter. And this was the standard of culture. It was like, bet, you're not going to have my bread? Give me your kids. Your kids will be my slaves. And this woman is dealing with this grief that she's facing because of the fact that she lost her husband and also the fear of knowing that she might also lose her children. But in this moment of desperation, she didn't turn to some of the things that some of us turn to when we're gripped with fear and anxiety. Like some of us might turn to vape or some of us might turn to a blunt or some of us might turn to different things that will help numb our minds in the moment. No, the woman didn't turn to a source. She turned to the source, the plug, the one who gave her access to the father, the one who gave her access to the word. And let me tell you something, man of God, woman of God, I don't know what you've been dealing with this week, but let me tell you who you have access to. Because of the work that Jesus did on the cross, let me tell you, you don't need a preacher or a prophet to get a word from God. Why? Because you have access to the word of God. And when you get the word of God in you, you begin to learn how to discern the word, the rhema of God, to where God will begin to speak to you and give you wisdom and insight on how to deal with that situation you're dealing with. I don't know if you know it, but you have access to the Holy One, the only one who is seated on the throne. The one who is above the issues and the problems that you're dealing with. Listen, because of the work that was done on the cross, when Jesus died, he literally became the bridge between us and him. And now we have access. Turn to your neighbor and say, I got access. Turn to your other neighbor and say, do you know you got access? We have access to Jesus. When we give our life to Jesus, we don't got to wait until Sunday to get in front of a man of God. We don't got to wait until that next YouTube video comes out from our favorite church. No, we get to access God in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of when things are going on at home, in the middle of when you're battling your own mental health issues, in the middle of the mess when you're battling fear and anxiety. You get to go to the one who is seated on the throne. The scripture describes him as the mighty counselor. Who else should we turn to in the midst of our fears and our anxieties and the emotions that we deal with? Yes, at times we should turn to a therapist, but when we don't have access to that, we have access to God. Second, you know what you need to know? When anxiety attacks, you need to know what is inside of you. Matter of fact, let me rephrase it. You need to know who is inside of you. The scripture said that when the woman talked to the prophet, the prophet said, what do you have in your house? And she said, all I got is this oil. Can I tell you something about oil? Oil in the Bible often is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
oil was used to anoint people. Oil was a very hot commodity. It was an expensive thing that was used for many different things. They used oil for the lights that they had. They used oil for anointing. They used oil for cooking. And this woman thought that what she had was not enough. But let me tell you something. The oil that we have is called the Holy Spirit. When you give your life to Jesus, not only do you have access to God, but the Holy Spirit comes alive in you. <clears throat> and let me rephrase even how I wrote this. I said you need to know what's inside of you, but I didn't want to scare you because you need to know who is inside of you. The Holy Spirit isn't an it. It isn't a they. It isn't this creepy thing that'll make you scream. No, the Holy Spirit is a person, the third person next to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who lives inside of you. In other words, when you give your life to Jesus, the same spirit that was in Jesus comes alive in you. And when you know that you got that oil in you, when you know you got the spirit of God in you, you know something that is very powerful and larger and greater than any anxiety or fear that you will ever feel. When you know what's inside of you, you know that the Holy Spirit gives you peace. The word says that he gives us peace that surpasses our understanding. When you know that you have the Holy Spirit in you, you know that the Holy Spirit also gives you joy. And joy isn't based off of your circumstances. Joy isn't based off of how you feel. Joy isn't based off of how much is in your bank account or what friend group you have. Joy isn't based off of how many likes you got off of that post that you made. No, joy only comes from God. And no man or woman can give or take that from you. Joy is an attribute and a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So when you receive the Holy Spirit, not only do you receive peace, but you receive joy. Know what is inside of you. The spirit of God is inside of you. And not only that, not only does he give you peace, not only does he give you joy, but a scripture in Isaiah talks about the fact that he gives a spirit of wisdom. So when we're anxious because we don't know what decision to make, we get to go to the only one who can give us that information. And he speaks to us through his Holy Spirit and he gives us wisdom on every decision that we need to make. The book of Isaiah it also talks about the spirit gives us understanding. The spirit gives us knowledge. The spirit gives us, gives us counsel. The spirit gives us might. It's only by the Holy Spirit that I can stand on my two feet most of these days because I'll be so tired because everything else that I got going on. But it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of might that gives me the energy and the strength to push through. It's only by the Holy Spirit and not the church face that I might put on sometimes that helps me to put a smile on in the midst of my circumstance. And you have access not only to that God who's seated on the throne, but you have access to the Holy Spirit who can live in you when you give your life to him. Last thought, because I got to let y'all get to y'all groups. And the last thought is, when anxiety attacks, you need to know who is beside you. Know who is beside you. So the woman went to the man of God. She got a word. She got revelation. She got understanding on what to do. He said, then go in your house, get the oil. She got the oil. But then after she got the oil, the man told her to now go out to the community that you're in. Go out to the people that you have proximity to. Go out to the people that God has placed around you, and through that, you will find the solution to your issues. That's why God has put us in community. When the woman went into her house, she got the oil, and the man of God gave her this awesome business strategy, and she went out not only to make money, but she went out to meet the needs of her community. You need to understand who God put beside you. Some of us are living in isolation. And with our own self-righteousness, we think we're good Christians because we go to church and we know our word, but we don't spend time with the people that God has called us to. And when we do that, we're actually living in disobedience and self-righteousness. God didn't call us to have an individualistic Christian relationship. No, Christianity is meant to experience and lived out in the context of community. It is through community that you will find your purpose. One of my favorite preachers says, people are your purpose partners. You can never become who God has created you to be without the right people in proximity. Who has God put beside you? 
And some of them people, let me be real with you, some of them people that's beside you, you ain't even supposed to be with. You know they ain't good for you. You know they holding you back from becoming who God has called you to be. You know you need to get out of that circle and trust God and step into a new sphere of influence and a new group of people that will help you become who God has called you to be. And I'm not talking about go be an opportunist, not going looking for the plug and the person who can put you on. No, I'm talking about going out, not only to receive, but to help meet needs. God has put certain people in your lives, but let me ask you, what are you doing about that? In those moments, when we understand who we have access to, when we understand what is inside of us, and we understand who God has put beside us, not only will we be able to overcome all anxiety and fear and challenges that come our way, but we will become the women and men of God that this world needs. You are an answer to a problem in this society. There are so many issues in society, and we live in such an anxious culture. But I believe that God has put something inside of you. He has called you and designed you and wired you in a very unique way. And once you get an understanding of who he is and who he has created you to be and the group of people that he has called you to impact, you will be a world changer. The issues that have caused you to be anxiety will be beneath you and you will be able to bring down the strongholds in this society. Those things that might make you anxious and fearful and angry at times. I may believe that sometimes God has allowed those things to happen because those things can be a burden to us. And then we'll realize like, yo, this ain't never happening in my family again. This stuff that I see going on with my parents that's making me anxious, this stops with me. I am not going to make the same mistakes. I'm going to go to the word of God and not go to what that person did. When we start seeing the anxiety things in our schools and how people are killing each other over a vape and weed... We're going to realize this is a burden, and God has put me in this situation to be a solution. You got the keys. You got the spirit of God in you, and you have access to the only one, the holy one, who is seated on the throne. So tonight, I want to talk about that. I want us to get in our groups, and I want us to be transparent. As I was transparent and let y'all know some of the things that have made me anxious, I want y'all to take some time to talk. And I want y'all to be real. Like, I don't know about you, but sometimes I make mistakes. Like, I get anxious and then I just do things that is just stupid. And it just makes me even more anxious. <clears throat> so, we ain't judging you. So, I want y'all to talk about, like, some of the things like, yo, I get anxious about certain things. And sometimes I go to this and I go to that with no judgment. Let's talk about it. And then let's take moments to just go through the word of God and see what the word of God says about that so that we can find the answers and the solutions to get out of our mess and our anxiety. Are y'all down for that? Well, let me pray for you. I got two groups of people I want to pray for. I want to pray for one group of people tonight who have just been battling anxiety and a mix of emotions that I didn't even acknowledge tonight. And if that's you tonight, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But I do want to pray for you. I want to pray for everyone in here who has just been battling any kind of pressure or mental health issue or just, just the weight of life. And secondly, I want to pray for a group of people who don't even know Jesus. Again, I said tonight, when anxiety attacks, you better know who you have access to. And some of you don't know Jesus. Tonight I told you that when anxiety attacks, you better know who is inside of you. But the Holy Spirit is only inside of believers, followers of Jesus. So tonight, if that's you, if God sent you here tonight, and you're feeling like tonight is the night you want to give your life to Jesus. With every head bowed, every eye closed, can you just raise your hand so I can know exactly who I'm praying for in this room? so glad you came tonight. I saw you outside. I'm proud of you. You've been in church all day. You know how I feel. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm going to pray for y'all. Jesus, we thank you so much for what you have done on the cross. And the scripture says that by your stripes we are healed. 
healed not only in our bodies, but healed in our minds, healed in our spirits. So right now, through the power of your blood and the work that was done on the cross, I speak healing over the minds and the bodies and the spirits of every person in this room. I speak to their brains. And I pray that you will bring balance to their chemical mindset, to their brains, to every cell and ligament and neuron. I speak balance into their minds and into their brains and into their DNAs. Some of them, they come from families. And they heard, oh, my mom dealt with this mental health disorder. My dad dealt with that. So I guess I might be dealing with it too. We cancel that lie. It stops with you. The blood of Jesus is covering you right now. And you are healed in the name of Jesus. Right now, I pray for those who raise their hands. And tonight, God, I pray that you will speak to them in a fresh way as they go into their groups. And that they will understand that making a decision to follow you isn't about raising a hand. But it's about leaving everything that hinders us from walking with you. So Holy Spirit, I pray that tonight you will speak to them in a fresh way. And they will know exactly what they need to repent of. In other words, what they need to let go of. What mindsets they need to change. And the mindset of Christ that they need to take on. And I thank you that because they receive salvation, not only do they receive a place in heaven one day. But even on this side of eternity, they receive the Holy Spirit. So right now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will come and move in our hearts and our minds. Spirit of wisdom, fill this room as we have these conversations. Spirit of peace, come. Peace that surpasses our understanding. Fill us up. And help us to become who you have created us to be.